so much. And thank you so much to everyone who organized this amazing event. It really reminds me that when I was door knocking with Lily, I must say, <laughs> um, for my campaign, I was struck over and over again by how many really smart people we have in this community and how we have experts in just the widest range of things. And I always thought, you know, if we put our heads together, I'm sure we can solve some problems. Um, because we really have a lot of talent here, as you're seeing this morning. So, I sit on the Environment and Transportation Committee and uh, in Annapolis, and we hear bills on environment and transportation, obviously, but also um, housing, animal issues, land use, natural resources. It's really a wide variety of things, and I will say that Republicans and Democrats on the committee all are trying to move us in a direction of a cleaner, greener future. So we all know where we're headed, but it's amazingly hard to figure out exactly how to get there. For one thing, as Yogi Berra said, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. So, we struggle with a number of things. One is, transitions are really hard. And we know we have to transition to a world that looks pretty different than the world we live in right now. Uh, we want to be in zero emission vehicles, right? Buses, trucks, cars. But we don't have the charging infrastructure for that. So, the chicken or the egg. It's really hard to know how to incentivize or mandate or just kind of put your finger on the scale to get there. Another issue we have constantly is competing goods. We want more open space. We want more forest. We also need more housing. We need more housing, but we don't want more kids in schools. We don't want more cars on the roads. So there are so many times when the things that we want don't necessarily go together. There's a lot of balancing to be done. But one of the things I want to talk about um, more seriously today is something that underlies everything, and um, we have to figure it out, and that is the growing gap between the haves and have-nots in our society. Um, I wanted to share with you a study that I read, and you may have seen this, it got quite a bit of press, from a conservative think tank called uh, American Compass. And they did a study where they looked at nominal wages and nominal costs in 1985 and then again in 2022. And they found an extraordinary difference. So in, I, I have these numbers, but I'll just give you the approximate numbers. In 1985, it cost a typical man working full time in a middle class job <clears throat> about $17,500 to feed and house a family of four. So that's food, housing, transportation, um, higher education was in that as well. In 2022, oh, and the guy made about $23,500. So he was able to feed that family of four with 40 weeks of work. In 2022, it takes 62 weeks of work to cover those costs. So think about that change. In 1985, the American middle class was gaining ground. Now, we're losing ground to the tune of 10 weeks a year. So it's not surprising that we have a lot of people in our country who are scared, who are angry, and we have really polarized politics. So the subtitle of this study was, I think it was the, the catastrophic erosion of the American middle class, which might be a little hyperbolic. But it's clear that this is a profound change. And I'm not saying this so that everybody goes home and curls up in a little ball and cries. But I do think it's something that we need to turn around and that we can turn around. I feel that one of the biggest parts of this 
is our education system. So I am really optimistic uh, about the blueprint for Maryland's future, which is that enormous piece of legislation that we passed and which the governor has put $500 million into um, that includes free early childhood education and really a major overhaul of our entire education system. I truly believe that is the foundation of changing that trajectory of middle-class America falling further and further behind. But when you think about it, housing, higher education, and medicine have gone up way more than the rate of inflation for decades. So it's not surprising that we found ourselves in this situation. And I'm not waxing nostalgic for 1985, I promise you. Yes, medicine is much more expensive than it was then. It's also much better. But housing and education, not so much. They're really just more expensive. And that is a very, very difficult thing for our children. So when we think about how nice it is that our houses have gone up X hundred percent in value, think about the fact that that's what our kids now have to pay for a house. And that is not sustainable. We, we can't have a sustainable future with an economy that doesn't work for a huge percentage of America. As um, our food scientist was saying, everything is connected. I thought that was beautiful the way she ended her talk. Everyone is connected to everyone. And our future has to happen together without leaving anybody behind. But as dark as this sounds, there are so many opportunities in every one of these problems. For example, in housing, I am sure there are ways to cut the price per square foot of housing practically in half with new technologies, with new building modalities. There are companies that are already doing this. It's just something we need to put our minds to and focus on. We need to think about it as much as we think about transitioning to a different energy economy <clears throat> and, and really to a different way of life. So uh, I, have, I have every confidence that many of the people in this audience will be the innovators who come up with ways to change that trajectory and lower costs for the things that we really care about and uh, share and create an economy that works for every one of us. So thank you so much for having me and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.